Hello, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to this uh, sort of emergency STAT 1793 lecture. Uh, I'd like to start off by just thanking you for sort of your accommodations, your flexibility with this. I apologize in advance if my uh, voice is a little bit off, but you know I've got my tea down here and and uh, water over there, so hopefully we can make it through this uh, despite sort of what's going on with my throat. Um, I'll also say that, of course, because this is just being posted as a video, uh, I recognize that, you know, you might not be able to ask the questions that you want or get answers from me sort of as it's going. So please, of course, feel free to reach out to me via email, set up some time to come see me in office hours, uh, set up a Teams meeting. I'm happy to go through anything that you have uh, questions about throughout this lecture uh, as soon as sort of we can. And then hopefully this way, you know, you can watch back any parts of this that are that are confusing, take a look at the notes once they're posted, and then get clarifications with me as those are needed uh, going forward. But with that, uh, the lecture today is going to pick up where we left off last time. Uh, so last time we were talking about conditional expectations and conditional variances. And so <clears throat> the idea there, right, is that with an expectation or a variance, what we're trying to do is summarize the behavior of a random variable. So random variables are described by their probability mass function, right? And the issue with that is that oftentimes these mass functions are going to be complex. They have a lot of information in them. You know, there's sort of a lot going on. And so if we're just sort of trying to understand what's happening with these random quantities, what we might want to know is, you know, what do we expect to happen or how much variability is there going to be when we make observations from these random variables? And so <clears throat> with that, what we're thinking about is uh, using them as sort of summary statistics for uh, a whole distribution. Right. And so then we saw that we can do the same thing where instead of working from a marginal distribution, we can work from a conditional distribution. And some of the motivation there was that we can come up with these scenarios where it's easier for us to think about the conditional distribution than it is to think about a marginal distribution. Right. So the example we had was if you're playing a game where you have to first roll a die and then you flip a coin that number of times, well, then you're in this situation where if you know what comes up on the die that you're rolling, then it becomes quite easy for us to think about those coin flips. However, if you do not know what number comes up on that die that you're gonna be rolling, then it's a lot harder to reason about how many heads we might see, for instance, right? And so in that case, using the conditionals and then working from the conditionals to get back to the marginals is going to be sort of an appropriate way of trying to approach that question. And so we're gonna pick up uh, sort of from that line of thinking, except instead of working on conditional distributions today, we're gonna to be working with marginal, or with joint distributions, rather. <clears throat> so, to sort of motivate this problem, uh, we'll have this example here, where what we're doing is we're starting with this uh, worker, you know, they run a business of some sort, and the total cost of any of the orders that they serve up at their business is given by uh, two sort of factors, right? So there's the number of components, which we're calling X, as well as the uh, cost per component, right? And if you know how many uh, components they sell in an order and you know the cost per component in that order, the total cost of the order is going to be the product of those two quantities, right? And what we want to be thinking about here is what is going to be the expected value of this total. So if we're thinking about uh, sort of trying to get the expected value of this total, there's a few things that you might think to do sort of immediately, right? And the first is maybe to say, okay, well, the expected value of the total is the expected value of x times y, which maybe, and we'll throw a little question mark on there because we're not sort of sure about this yet, but maybe this is the expected value of x times the expected value of y, right? And that would be reasonable. We saw sort of expectations behaving nicely with, uh, linear functions, right? And so this feels maybe this would work. Uh, unfortunately, this is not going to be the case in general. In general, we won't be able to say this. And so we sort of need other tools. And so then if you go back to the drawing board, the thing that I would sort of point out to you is that if you know, for instance, that x is equal to, say, 10, right? And y is equal to 100, for instance, right? Then knowing these two pieces of information tells us that t is going to be equal to 1,000, right? And so then in this case, what we can say is, well, if we can figure out what's the probability that this happens, right? So if we can work out the prob of this event, then what we can say is that that event corresponds 
to having a total of a thousand, right? And so the way that we're going to work out the prob probability of this event is using the joint probability, right? Where specifically in this case, we would want the joint probability of X and Y at 10 and 100. And this is going to correspond right here to a total of a thousand, right? And so the idea is when we have these functions that deal with multiple random variables in one go, we can't sort of do the, the easy thing, or we're just going to split it up, or at least not in general. But what we can do is write down our joint uh, probability mass function and then work from there and sort of derive the results that we need from the joint mass function in this way. And so that leads us to sort of our first definition here, which is going to be the joint expectation. And so throughout the class today, we're always thinking of sort of having a function that takes in multiple random variables, right? So we have some function g of x and y, right? And so this could be x times y, this might be x plus y, right? Sort of any, any function that we have there. And what we want to know is the expected value of g x y right and so this is what we would call the joint expectation right here the joint expectation of g x y and in general it's going to follow the same sort of pattern for the definition of joint expectation or the definition of expectation as we've seen for every other type of expectation we've defined right so we're going to say the expected value of g x y is going to be the summation over all possible values and the thing to note here is we have all possible values for x, but we also have to sum over all possible values for y, right? And then we plug in the function that we want here, so that's g, x, y, times by the probability, which in our case is going to be the joint probability of x and y, right? And so it looks a whole lot like every other definition for expectation that we've had here, where the two things to note is that we have this sort of double summation out front, and we're using the joint probability function here, right? Otherwise, it's sort of the natural extension of the definition of expectation. <clears throat> now, we can take the same sort of idea and apply it to the variance, right? So we might ask, what is the variance of g, x, y? And the idea is that we're just going to plug g, x, y into our definitions for variance, right? And so we can take a look at this as the expected value of g x y minus its expectation squared, right? And this expectation is a joint expectation directly. And so is this outer expectation, right? That's also going to be a joint expectation because it's a function of more than one random variable where this whole thing on the inside is the function that we're taking the expected value of. Now, every time that we've seen the variance, we've also seen us taking uh, sort of what we've been calling the shortcut for calculation, right? So you can take the expected value of gxy squared minus the expected value of gxy, where we square the outside, right? And so that's still going to work here. And uh, just like in the regular case, this is oftentimes going to make our calculations a little bit easier to do. Okay, so we have these definitions, they sort of track nicely with what we're doing before, except instead of using the marginal or the conditional mass functions, we're going to be using the joint mass function. So then we can introduce this example here, right? And this example is sort of the extension of uh, the introduction here, right? And so we're thinking about x and y as following these two distributions, right? So <clears throat> x is going to take on either a value of 1, 2, or 3, with a 25%, 50%, and 25% chance. And then y is either going to be 100 or 200, equally likely. We're further supposing that x and y are independent. And the importance of this assumption, right, is that the joint probability is going to equal the product of the two marginal probabilities. Right, so that's going to simplify down our work a little bit here where what we can do is we can come up into this expression that we have up here and just simply plug in probability of x times the probability of y. So if we actually sort of want to find the expected value of x times y, we can write out 
our expression here, right? It's x, y. We have x times y. And then we want the joint probability of x and y. <clears throat> so in this case, we're going to be summing from x equals 1 up to 3. We're going to have summing of y, and y is going to either be 100 or 200. Right, and then we get x times y. And then here, we can use the independence to rewrite this as the probability of x times the probability of y, right? And so now it's just sort of the tedious matter of actually plugging into this expression, writing it out, and simplifying, right? And so we're going to start sort of um, for x equals 1, right? We have x times by y, which the first y is going to be 100, times by the probability of x, which is 0 0.25, times by the probability of y, which is 0 0.5, plus 1 times by, now y is 200, times by 0 0.25, times by 0 0.5, right? And then we can go on to x equals 2. And the thing that I'll sort of point out here is that when x equals 2, right, we're going to take 2 times by 100, times by 0 0.5, times by 0 0.5, and then we're going to take 2 times by 200 times by 0 0.5 times by 0 0.5. And so that 2 times 0 0.5 is going to be common between all of the terms. And we could have done the same thing with the first term here, right? Where in each of them, we have this 1 times by 0.25, right? 1 times by 0.25. And so I can write this out, just sort of factoring things out, make the math a little bit easier for us to, to sort of write down, right? So we can write 2 times 0.5 and then... 100 times 0.5 plus 200 times by 0.5. And then we get 3 times 0.25 times by 100 times by 0.5 plus 200 times by 0.5, right? And again, sort of a tedious sum to actually write down. But if you were to work this out with your calculator, you could figure out that you're going to have an expected total of 300, right? And we can try to think about, does this make a little bit of sense to us, right? <clears throat> and we're equally likely for items to be priced either at 100 or 200. And then they're equally likely to have either one, two, or three items in the order. And so if you sort of start to work this out, 300 at least seems sort of reasonable, right? Uh, you know, sort of the most likely is that we're going to have two um, items Right? And then if you have two items with 100, that's 200 total. If you have uh, two items with 200 each, that's 400 total. The halfway point there is 300, you know, makes a little bit of sense. So hopefully that, you know, makes a little bit of sense. But again, without that intuition, we can rely on sort of the formal derivation that we have going on here. All right? So the next part is to take the same example and to find the variance of x times y. And so as is the typical, as is typical for us, we're going to start by working out what the expected value of gx squared is going to be. Right, and so <clears throat> if we take expected value of xy squared, right, this is the same thing as the sum over values of x, the sum over the values of y, xy squared, probability of x, y. Right? And so it's going to look essentially like what we had here, except instead of it being a 1 times 100, it's going to be a 1 squared times 100 squared, right? And so forth, you know, 2 and 3 and so on. And so we can start writing this all out, and I'm going to write it out in that sort of factored way that we were doing before. So we're going to get 1 squared times 0.25 times by 100 squared times by 0.5 plus 200 squared times by 0.5, and then take on x as a value of 2, 0.5, same thing here, right, 100 squared, 0.5, 200 squared, 0.5, and then 3 squared, 0.25, 100 squared times by 0.5, plus 200 squared times by 0.5. Right, and so it's essentially the same thing as what we had on the previous slide, but here, uh, you know, we're squaring all of the terms. 
And again, you can just sort of plug this into your calculator. And if you do so, I believe that you should get 112,500, right? And so then to actually work out what the variance of xy is, that's going to be the expected value of xy squared minus the expected value of x times y squared. Right, we just worked out that that's 112,500. We worked out on the first question that that's 300 squared. Right, And so if you actually do that math there, you should find that it's 22,500 as the variance of x times y. Right, and so using sort of those definitions, we can work out expected values, we can work out variances, right? Now, <clears throat> there's this sort of follow-on question we have here, and this sort of relates to what we were talking about last class, and that is, what is the expected value of x times y given y is equal to 200? All right, and so there's sort of two ways that we could think about doing this, right? You could walk through the whole conditional distribution as we did last time, but the other thing that we could take a note of is that if we know that y is 200, right? So if y is equal to 200, <clears throat> then x times y is 200x, right? If I tell you that the cost per item is 200, then the total cost is going to be 200 times the number of items that you sell. And so what that means is that if we have the expected value of x times y, given y is equal to 200, this has to be equal to the expected value of 200 times by x, given y is equal to 200, right? And this is, of course, <clears throat> just the expected value, or 200 times, the expected value of x given y is equal to 200. And now the thing that I'll point out here is that x given y, well, we know that x and y are independent of each other, right? And so this is just the expected value of x because probability of x given y is just the probability of x since x and y are independent of each other. And so the expected value of x we can write out as 1 times 0.25 plus 2 times 0.5 plus 3 times by 0.25, right? And I believe that that should equal 2, right? And so the expected value of x is 2. And so then we plug this back in and we get 200 times by 2, which is 400. And so the thing that I'm going to point out here is that we have sort of this, what I'll call an interplay between the joint expectations and conditioning. And in particular, if you want to take the expected value of some function of g of x, y, and we're told that y is equal to some value, just say little y, well then what we can always do is we can always plug this in as g of x and then the little y, and we still need to be conditioned on this value, right? But it allows us to sort of then treat this as a simply conditional expectation, right? Because now g of x, y, the only thing that's random in this, ex uh, in this expression right here is the x still, right? So then that's sort of solved using the tools that we saw in the last class, right? And so anytime that you're conditioning, you can pull that argument in, right? And that's the idea right, that we're saying here. If you know that y is 200, then x times y is 200 times x, right? And so it's the exact same thing no matter what function you're looking at here, okay? So we've seen multiplication, but what we might also want to look at is, say, addition, right? And addition is going to be quite nice for us because it's actually not going to matter what our distributions are, right? And so let's let's try to work this out. So what we want to do is we want to take g of x, y to be x plus y, and we want to find the expected value. And so we want the expected value of x plus y 
right? And sort of by definition, this is going to be uh, the expect or the sum over x, the sum over y, x plus y times by the joint probability. Right. And so what I can do is I can expand out this addition here, right? And so that's going to leave me with the sum over x, the sum over y of x times by uh, the joint probabilities here, plus the sum over x, the sum over y of y times by the joint probabilities here. Okay. Now, if we think about what's going on here, right, <clears throat> this x has nothing to do with this y. And so what we can do is we can pull it out into the front summation, right? These are the rules of summations. They're summarized at the start of the course notes, worth taking a, a sort of a peek at if you don't remember these, right? But we can write this as the sum over x of x times by the sum over y of the joint probability here. Right? And what are we wanting to do with this? Well, the thing that I want to do here is I actually want to switch which order we're summing over. So it doesn't matter if you add up the y's first or the x's first, you're going to get to the same thing, right? Because you can always rearrange the order that you're adding things up in. So I can write this up in this way. Uh, and sorry, this should be x, y on both of these. <clears throat> right? And so now what are we looking at? Well, if I draw your attention right here to uh, this, not the eraser, I want to highlight it, draw your attention to this term right here, right? What we've seen through marginalization or the law of total probability is that if you sum over one of the variables of the joint distribution, that always equals the other marginal distribution, right? And so this summation right here is exactly equal to the marginal probability of x, right? The sum over y of probability x, y gives us the probability of x. And what are we looking at over here? Well, we're going to do the same trick. We're going to pull this out front, right? And so if we actually just sort of do that here, right? So we actually just sort of write this out front as y times by the sum over x, then what we're noticing or what we can notice is that this is the sum over x of the joint probability. And so then by definition, this thing right here is equal to the probability of y. Right? And so come right in this sort of simplifying down x, x times the probability of x plus the sum over y of y times the probability of y. But now look at what each of these terms is, right? So this term right here, this is what we define to be the expected value of x. And this term right here is what we define to be the expected value of y. And so then taken together, what we find is that the expected value of x plus y is going to be the expected value of x plus the expected value of y. Right? So we get this really nice sort of simplifying uh, situation here, which is reminiscent of the additivity that we've seen with expectations before. But here we're dealing with multiple different random quantities. So if you have any two random quantities, independent or not, we don't care. If you add them up, the expected value of you adding them up is the same thing as you adding each of their expectations individually. Right? And this is a really nice property. It's going to come in very handy when we start doing uh, some more statistics in uh, very soon in this class. So we have this really nice property with expectation. Wouldn't it be nice if we had this really nice property with variance as well? And it would be very nice. Unfortunately, we're not going to have this very nice property with uh, variance. And if you're interested, you can work through sort of a similar uh, derivation as what we have going on here, right? Um, <clears throat> it's a little bit more tedious, the algebra. The full solution to that is in the course notes, right? So we actually walk through it in full there. But I'm just going to write down sort of what the final solution is going to be for us. 
All right, so if we take the variance of x plus y, <clears throat> what we're going to find is that this is going to be the variance of x plus the variance of y plus 2 times this expected value of, and then what we have here is x minus the expected value of x, y minus the expected value of y. Right, and so what we have is we have sort of the initial summation here, but then we add on 2 times this other term over here, which is this uh, joint expected value. And right here, this term, we'll end up calling the covariance. And it's the covariance because it's sort of like the variance, except it sort of measures this relationship between x and y, right? And so it's sort of uh, similar to variance, except we have multiple things going on here. And so as a general rule, the variance of x plus y is not going to be equal to the variance of x plus the variance of y, right? And so we don't quite get the same nice linear property here, but we do have this still simplified form uh, where what we're going to be dealing with is the uh, this covariance term here, right? And so that's sort of worth uh, defining on itself. And so covariance we can think of as a measure of association between two random variables. Okay, and so if you've seen or heard of, for instance, correlations, well, the covariance is directly related to the correlation, right? So if things have a positive correlation, if they're positively correlated, then they're also going to have a positive covariance. And so it's the, sort of this measure of how two different random variables behave together. But mathematically, we say that the covariance of x and y is, and we wrote down this on the previous slide, but you know, here again for completion, x minus the expected value of x times by y minus the expected value of y, right? And so one of the things that we might say, for instance, is um, if you take the covariance of x with itself, right? <clears throat> In this case, we're going to be plugging in x uh, and expect value of x into the equation up here. And so then that's going to be the expected value of x minus the expected value of x squared, right? And this is just the variance of x, right? And so the covariance is still related to the variance. If you take a variable's covariance with itself that just gives you back its variance. Um, but in general, we can sort of take the measure between multiple different random variables, right? And so the covariance is going to come up a whole lot throughout sort of the study of statistics, but for now we'll sort of leave it at that uh, definition. Um, and so what we have here, right, is we have uh, sort of this, this example that's going to start to put some of these things uh, to the test for us, right? So <clears throat> we want to look at, we have this joint distribution function here. And we're given that the expected value of x is equal to the expected value of y, which is equal to this thing. And the variance of x is equal to the variance of y, which is equal to this thing. And what we want to find is what is the expected value of x plus y and what's the variance of x plus y. And so we can use those formulas that we just wrote down here. So the expected value of x plus y is going to be the expected value of x plus the expected value of y, right? And um, this is going to be 700 over 251 plus 700 over 251, which is 1400 over 251. Right. <clears throat> now, if we want to take the variance, we're going to need to calculate the covariance, right? And so 
actually to calculate the covariance, I should show one additional trick that we can have um, going on up here. And the covariance of x and y can also be written as the expected value of x times y minus the expected value of x times by the expected value of y, right? And so in this case, you can always simplify the covariance to this expression here, right? Which again, looks a lot like our variance expression. If you plug in x for y, then you get the expected value of x squared minus the expected value of x, that whole thing squared, right? So this is again, a useful sort of shortcut for our calculations. And the reason that this is going to come in handy for us is because to get the variance of x plus y, we need the variance of x plus the variance of y, both of which we have, right, as this sort of annoying looking fraction right here, plus two times the covariance of x and y, right? And if we want the covariance of x and y, what we know is that we actually already have the expected value of x, and we actually already have the expected value of y, right? And so because of that, what we can do is we can write down uh, that to find the covariance, we need the expected value of x, y, and then it's going to be minus 700 over 251 times 700 over 251. And so then this whole question becomes, what is the expected value of x times y? <clears throat> and this is an expression that we know how to calculate, right, given our joint distribution here. And so to calculate this, we need to take the sum over all values of x, sum over all values of y, x, y times the probability of x, y, right? In this case, we have both x and y are ranging between 1 and 4. So x is 1 to 4, y is 1 to 4, right? And then we take x, y, and up here, we're going to get 14 times by x, y divided by 251 x plus y, right? And so then we could start to write this out. And there's going to be 16 terms in the summation here, right? So that's sort of quite a lot, a lot more than what's going to come up on any of your quizzes or, or whatnot. And so instead, you might think to just plug this into your uh, computer or into a calculator that sort of allows you uh, to do this a little bit easier. And if you actually do that, I believe that you should be getting uh, 9,831 divided by 1255. Right. And so this sort of you can again get from a um, from your computer or whatever, this is going to be bigger than what you're asked to do on a quiz for sure. But then we can actually plug in this value into the covariance formula here. All right. So then we find that the covariance of X and Y is going to be whatever we found 9831 over 1255 minus 700 over 251 squared, right? And if you actually work out what that covariance is, that's going to be uh, approximately 0 0.0558, uh, 0 say, right? And so then what we can do is we can take this, we can plug it into our covariant or into our variance formula for the summation over here, right? And so then what we're going to get is that the total variance is going to be two times this expression plus two times the variance there, right? So sort of taken together, variance of x plus y is going to be equal to two times by uh, 353419 divided by 315005. Right, and that's because that's both variance of x and variance of y, plus two times by this point zero zero five eight. Uh, sorry, just one zero there, I guess. Uh, make a mistake. Zero point zero five eight. Right, and so then you can actually again just plug this into your calculator and work out that the answer should be. 2.356, so. right? 
And so that would be how we get to the variance there. And so the thing that I'll point out with the variance of summations, they're worse to work out than the expectations are, right? The expectation is quite nice. You just add up the different expected values. The variances are quite a lot more annoying to deal with, All right? And so um, we can sort of work from there. Now, so far we've just been sort of assuming that X and Y are, uh, you know, general random variables. But we can oftentimes make this extra assumption here that X and Y are going to be independent of each other, right? And so if we suppose that we can write out our function so that we can separate it into one part that depends only on X and a different part that depends only on Y, then it turns out that if we can write uh, that they're independent of each other, if we know that they're independent of each other, we can simplify this expression down quite a lot. Okay, and so sort of what do we mean here? Well, just to give a quick example of what I might mean by a valid gx here, right? If we take g of x, y is equal to x times y, right? Well, then we can take h of x to just be x, f of y to just be y, and that's going to work out. However, if we were to take something like g of x, y is equal to x to the power of y, there is no way to write this uh, directly without without sort of doing some additional modifications that we wouldn't want to make in this formation of h times f, right? Because here, the x and the y sort of can't be separated out. So when we're in this situation where they can be separated out, and we know that it's independent, then we can simplify down this process. All right, and so how do we do this? Well, we start by writing down what our definitions are. So the expected value of g of x, y, is equal to the sum over all values for x, the sum over all values for y, gxy times by the joint probability, right? And so now we can sum over x, sum over y. Here, we can write down g of x as h of x times uh, f of y, right? And because we know that they're independent, we can write this right here, their joint probability, is going to be given by the product of the two marginals, right? And so we can write this as probability of x, probability of y. Now we can sort of group together the terms with the x's and the terms with the y's, right? And so we get here, this is the sum over x, the sum over y of h of x, uh, probability of x times by uh, f of y probability of y, All right? <clears throat> and now what we see is that this first term has nothing to do with the y. And so just sort of like what we were doing before, we can pull that through and we can write this as the sum over x of h of x probability of x times by the sum over y f of y probability of y, right? But now if we think about this and we think about our law of the unconscious statistician, right? This right here is just the expected value of f of y, right? And so because this is just the expected value of f of y, well, we can write that in as the expected value of f of y and that no longer has anything to do with x. And so we can actually write this as the expected value of f of y times by, and then we keep our summation here, Right? And so we're left with this sort of summation over x. But now if we look at this, this piece that we're left with is just the expected value of h of x. Right? And so sort of taking that together, what we get is that the expected value of g of x, y in this case, is going to be the expected value of h of x times by the expected value of f of y. And so when we know that things are independent and when we can split up the function that we're thinking about, then we can write uh, the, the expectation of the joint function as the product of the two expectations, right? And so if, for instance, we take a concrete example here, if x and y are independent, what is the expected value of x times y? 
So we want the expected value of x times y. Well, in this case, what we have is that uh, according to our notation up here, we have h of x is equal to x. We have f of y is equal to y, right? And so then in this case, we have the expected value of xy is equal to the expected value of h of x, which is just x, times by the expected value of f of y, which is just y, right? So we have the product, the expected value of the product is the product of the expectations. And again, this is only true if they are independent, right? Now, <clears throat> what this actually means for us in terms of this uh, sort of lecture here is that right off the bat, we had x and y being independent in this example here. And so what we could have done is we could have figured out that the expected value of x in this case is two, right? And we did work that out eventually. The expected value of y here, right, is going to be one half times 100, which is 50, plus one half times 200. So that's going to be 150. And so then we should get that the expected value of x times y is two times 150, which is exactly what we find down here. Right? And so that sort of would have been a quicker way of actually getting there. Now, <clears throat> we can use this result to help us simplify down our covariance, right? Because what we know is we know that the covariance of x and y is equal to the expected value of x times y minus the expected value of x times y, the expected value of y. So based on independence, we can write this as the expected value of x times the expected value of y, where this follows since x and y are independent, minus the expected value of x times the expected value of y. And so this is equal to zero. And so if x and y are independent, their covariance is zero. Now, I have to write out sort of a super important uh, point here. If x and y are independent, then the covariance is zero. However, if the covariance is zero, x and y may or may not be independent, right? And so if you know that they're independent, then you know that the covariance is zero. However, if all you know is that the covariance is zero, you don't know whether or not they're independent, right? And so this is an important uh, way. It only goes in one direction here. The covariance is going to be zero when they're independent, but if the covariance is zero, they may or may not be independent. And so you can come up with examples of dependent random variables that have covariances of zero. So just be careful of that, right? If I tell you that the covariance is zero, that does not mean that they're independent. But if I tell you that they're independent, that does mean that the covariance is zero. Right, so it's an important distinction there, one that's easy to get tripped up on, but uh, one that's important to keep uh, separate. So then we can sort of, you know, wrap uh, things up here, right, with this expression of what the variance of x plus y is going to be, right? So if we think about the variance of x plus y, well, the variance of x plus y, we've said was the variance of x plus the variance of y plus two times the covariance of x and y. <clears throat> well, if x and y are independent, right, then the covariance of x and y is going to be given, uh, or is going to exactly equal zero. And so if you know that x and y are independent, right, then what you also know is that x and y must be in a situation where their variance of the sum is just the sum of the variances, right? And so in this case, we're often going to be assuming that random variables are independent of one another. And we're often then going to be um, considering what happens to their summations. <clears throat> and I'll make one more important point here before moving on, and maybe I'll just create a, uh, I'll just go down here to make this. All of these same lessons are going to hold whether you have just your two random variables like we've been dealing with, or if you have many random variables. And so in particular, if we take x1 to xn to be iid, right? 
then what we might want to think about is what is the expected value of the sum from i equals 1 to n of xi, right? And so what we saw is that if you add up any random variables, independent or not, you can always write the expected value of their sum as the sum of the expected values, right? And now in this case, what we know is that because they're identically distributed, this is going to be equal to n times by the expected value of x, right? Where we're just thinking about that as being the expected value of any one of them. Similarly, if you were to take the variance of the summation in this case, right, sum i equals 1 to n of xi, well, because they're independent, right, the first i here being for independent, then what we know is that we can pull the summation out and write this as the sum from i equals 1 to n of the variance of xi. And then once again, because they're identically distributed, right, we're going to get that is n times by the variance of x, right? And so we get sort of these results over the sum of iid random variables. Now, <clears throat> What will actually end up coming up quite a lot in just sort of a couple of weeks here is instead of just looking at the sum, what happens if we look at the average, right? So we know that the average is going to be 1 over n, the sum from i equals 1 to n of xi, right? And so if you think about this, what we're doing is we're just taking this random quantity or this random quantity and multiplying it by a constant. And so we know how to deal with that. So the expected value of 1 over n times the sum from i equals 1 to n of xi is going to be 1 over n, and then you keep the expectation of that sum, right? And we worked out that this uh, summation here has expected value n times the expected value of x, right? And so then the n's are going to cancel, and this is just going to be left with the expected value of x. Right? So the expected value of the average is just the expected value of our random variable. And that makes some nice intuitive sense. We can think about what happens with the variance of the average as well. Right? So the variance of 1 over n times the sum from i equals 1 to n of xi. Well, whenever we multiply a variance by a constant, it comes out front squared. right? And then that's times the variance of this summation here, i equals 1 to n of xi, right? And now what we can see is that this uh, variance term that we're taking is n times the variance of x, right? And so if we write this in, then we're going to get n divided by n squared is 1 over n times by the variance of x. <clears throat> and these results are going to be centrally important when we stop talking about probability and when we start talking about uh, statistics a little bit more. So that's essentially everything that I wanted to cover today. I know that it's probably a lot, but I'll remind you again at this point, please feel free to take a look at the notes that are online, send me emails with any questions that you might have, set up some time to come see me in office hours. I'm happy to sort of address all of these. Hopefully this makes a little bit of sense and hopefully this sort of keeps us rolling uh, throughout this week, despite uh, sort of missing the in-person lecture uh, this week. And so I hope to see you all again in class uh, soon. And until then, uh, hope you all are having a great time.